we present, if you want to put your questions into the chat box, uh, that'd be uh, helpful. We'll address those at the end of the presentation here. Um, I have two colleagues on here on the call here today, um, Larry Trannell, who's a dairy field specialist in Northeast and Southeast Iowa, as well as Fred Hall, who's a dairy field specialist in Northwest Iowa. Uh, and so they'll help facilitate uh, answering those questions at the end with myself and Dr. Robert Van Zahn. So this is recorded and it will be archived on our Extension Dairy Team website, as well as our YouTube channel. And I'll include the PDFs um, as a follow-up. And then after the program, I'm also gonna put in an evaluation into the chat box. So if you could click on that at the towards the end of the program here, uh, that'll help us evaluate our programs. Um, if you don't get to it at the end here, I'll also do a follow-up email and, and get that sent out. So um, just to kind of start here, we are gonna have two different presentations. Uh, my name is Jennifer Bentley. I'm also a dairy field specialist with Iowa State University Extension and Outreach. And um, I'm gonna start off the, pre the, the webinar here today talking about colostrum management. And after I get done with that, we'll spend about 20 or 25 minutes with that topic. Then I'll turn it over to Robert Van Zahn um, with Penn State University. And so he's going to be talking about feeding the future and feeding those kids uh, beyond colostrum and into the weaning stage. So uh, just a little introduction on doc Dr. Robert Van Zahn before we get started here. Um, he has Dr. Dr. Van Zahn's colostrum research data uh, followed by um, he's been feeding He's joined Penn State faculty in 2000 as an extension veterinarian and is currently a professor of veterinary and biomedical sciences. Dr. Van Zahn provides extension programs across species on various nutrition, animal health, and reproductive topics regionally, nationally, and internationally. He is responsible for teaching courses on parasitology and pathology of nutritional diseases. His research interests include the role of nutrition and animal health and performance, especially pregnancy nutrition, and improving diagnostic tests to evaluate nutritional status. So we're happy to have him on our webinar here today. And as we um, get started here talking about dairy goat colostrum management, um, as I'm presenting, you'll notice some of my slides do have Penn State on them as well. Um, we merged our colostrum topic uh, ideas together to give you one presentation. So um, if at the end you have questions about some of the the topics or the research um, that are Penn State related, uh, Dr. Robert Van Zahn can definitely help answer those questions. So uh, when we talk about dairy goat colostrum, um, we know that there are similar uh, concepts to dairy cattle. A lot of my background is working with dairy cattle and young stock management, particularly calves, and in that colostrum management phase. Uh, but a lot of those same, same concepts can apply to uh, dairy goats when we're talking about colostrum quality, um, getting it in, in efficiently and making sure that uh, they're getting off on the right start. Uh, so we know that, you know, colostrum is often referred to as liquid gold because it's handled with care and there's very limited amounts that can be collected in a, in a short amount of time. So when we talk about those dairy goat kids, uh, what factors affect neonatal survival? Well, the top three that I think of are um, birth weights. Uh, many of you that are dairy goat producers out there uh, know that uh, when we deal with those small wheat kids, they're gonna take more time, more nutrients to um, be able to uh, get strong and have a higher survival rate versus uh, a larger, heavier kid that is born. Uh, there are also dam factors that we won't get into today, but making sure that our dam our doe is in good condition, body condition score, and that she's uh, produced enough colostrum that we can feed to those kids. And we know that colostrum is, is a gold standard for any species that we're working with. Um, it's required for optimal health. It's that first milk that's secreted um, and it has high levels of nutrients. If you look at this chart here, and you compare it to your milk, um, it really does have higher values, higher nutrient content of fat, protein, uh, immunoglobulins, which we aren't gonna find in our milk, uh, many minerals, trace minerals and vitamins, and also maternal immune cells and growth factors that we also don't find in our milk either. 
Um, so that's why it's very important uh, that we focus on that colostrum management uh, and focus on that immunoglobulins. So other factors that make good colostrum is vaccination. Um, and we're not going to get into vaccination protocols today, but I just would put this in here as a reminder that, you know, establishing a good veterinary client relationship is important um, for your herd uh, because there are certain things that can affect your herd versus somebody else's. And it's important to have those uh, vaccinations uh, for you as well as um, those dairy goat kids so that they can develop um, antibodies that are going to get delivered into that colostrum. So we want to be making sure that we're vaccinating early enough to allow antibodies to be secreted into the mammary gland, which then can be transferred into that kid once we start feeding them. Um, so without colostrum, kids really have little protection against their environment, uh, other animals. And so um, we want to make sure that we're providing that as quickly as possible. So what do we need to know? Uh, when we when we consider you know how we should feed colostrum, um, can it be measured accurately on farm? Um, you know a lot of our data that we have out there is relevant to our dairy cattle world, and so um, you know some of our benchmarks that we've been using have been related to dairy cattle, and so we really need to know how is that related to feeding our dairy goat kids? Um, so are there differences between dairy versus meat? And then how do we measure that at the end when that, when, when, when that dairy goat kid has consumed the colostrum? Uh, what values can we put on that? So that's some of the research that Penn State has been doing, uh, looking at um, those measurements, those benchmarks to see how they uh, are either the same or different than our dairy cattle world. So when you look at the summary of um, small ruminant colostrum studies, um, there hasn't been a lot of research uh, looking at colostrum IgG concentration in, in goat colostrum. And what you'll notice on this chart is it's very, it's highly variable uh, within breeds, um, particularly between milking uh, dairy breeds and meat breeds um, and even various sheep breeds. You see the range there, uh, when we look at colostrum IgG in dairy cattle, we would say our recommendation is about 50 grams up per, IG, per liter of colostrum that we would use as a high quality colostrum. And so when you look at this chart here, you see there's ranges from you know, 10, four, um, all the way up to 50 and above. And so there's just a high variability of um, the quality of, of colostrum that is collected collected in small ruminants. Just another way of looking at that, um, this is another uh, study and this one, this one was actually uh, based out of Switzerland. Uh, just looking at the IgG concentration of various goat, uh, goat breeds and the red bar is actually the, again, the dairy cattle recommendation of 50 grams per liter. And you can see those that are, are falling below that recommendation and we noticed that there are um, dairy goat breeds are falling well below that average versus our meat. And that could be due to concentration levels of IgGs of our dairy versus our meat goat type breeds. One thing that is similar to our dairy cattle um, goat or dairy cattle colostrum is that timing and how, how drastically that drops off from um, the first milking to uh, even three, four milkings into collecting that milk, um, there's a significant drop in those immunoglobulins. And we notice that here in this chart, and I'll have another one uh, later looking at just at, you know, that, that timing is really critical in collecting that milk um, within that first, first couple hours to get the highest concentration of IgGs. So, we ask ourselves, how do we determine what makes high quality colostrum? Then how do we measure high quality colostrum to know that we're actually feeding that to our dairy goat kids? Um, in my previous talks on dairy goat colostrum, I've always mentioned using this colostrometer as a way to measure the quality of the, you know, measure the IgGs in the milk. Um, but as I've um, 
been more exposed to the dairy goat industry, realizing that um, there may be times that we don't collect enough dairy goat colostrum um, to even be able to measure it in one of these uh, cylinder type uh, measurement tool instrument tools. Um, and so we have to think about how how else can we measure high quality colostrum uh, besides the colostrometer. There are different tools out there that we could use, um, particularly the digital BRICS refractometer or the optical uh, optical BRICS refractometer, um, where these require only a drop or two of colostrum uh, to measure the quality versus uh, maybe a couple ounces is what's needed with the colostrometer. So um, I am actually gonna launch my first poll question here, um, asking the audience about um, if, if we are measuring colostrum, how we measure that. So I'm gonna pull that up here. And Larry or Fred, maybe you can tell me if you if you can see that. Yep, sure can. Yes, okay. Can. So our question is measuring colostrum quality. How do you measure colostrum quality? Quality is it a visual assessment? Is it using the colostrometer, optical, optical bricks refractometer, or the digital bricks? And so it looks like we have about 55 participants on the call here today, and so we're about 50%. And so we may have people that aren't uh, dairy goat producers on the call, so they're not measuring. Um, so it looks like we're kind of slowed down here. So I'm gonna end the poll and then I'll share those out for you. Um, Larry, you're able to see the results there? Yes, we can. Yep, so um, looks like about a quarter of them are using visual assessments. Um, some are using the colostrometer, uh, and we have a fair amount using op optical bricks or a few using the digital bricks refractometer. And about over half do not measure colostrum quality before feeding. And I guess I didn't put in here, you know, whether or not these are dairy goat producers or you're just not measuring uh, before feeding, but, um, you know, using these tools does give us a good indication if we're going to getting proper uh, IgG levels into those dairy goat kids. So another um, project that Dr. Robert Van Zahn has collected data on is uh, taking these these colostrum quality samples and comparing it to you know those cutoffs of again those dairy, the dairy cattle. Uh, colostrum cutoffs of 50 grams. And where we see that BRICS model is, um, you know, we use 50 as our, is the red bar there. And if we draw the line down, um, actually our dairy goat colostrum could be reading around 19 or 20 on the BRICS versus our dairy cattle is out closer to 22 as our cutoff for the digital BRICS refractometer reading. Um, and this could be due to um, dairy goats having a higher fat globule content uh, and making that reading uh, more acceptable in that 1920 range versus uh, the 22 range. But you notice that there is also a, a chart here on um, sheep samples, and they do um, resonate closer to our dairy cattle cutoff of 22 um, versus the dairy goats. And again, just kind of looking at comparisons of uh, dairy goat colostrum um, and how variable it is across even just one farm. Um, this, this chart actually is just one farm and the variability of, of what we get on colostrum quality ranging from four all the way up to 180 is quite you know, significant. So I think it, that um, is just a, a story to tell that it's really important to measure on your own farm because not all uh, qual all, all dairy goats are going to produce the same quality of milk. Um, and so as we're trying to feed those kids, um, knowing that we're getting that high quality in, into them is important. As well as what does that look like once they've um, consumed that colostrum? How well are they absorbing it? Um, again, in our dairy cattle world, we use a cutoff of 10 milligrams per milliliter in that serum total protein. So when we're collecting those blood samples, uh, 10 is kind of our cutoff. And 
Um, in this project, um, they're actually showing the, that serum IgG in these dairy goat kids uh, closer to 15. And so we're getting high levels of IgG absorption um, at a rate of feeding about 35 grams of IgG. You notice the time to first feeding is about 106 minutes. So, you know, we're, we're seeing that we're um, getting plostrum into them within the first couple hours, and that's going to make a big difference on how well they absorb that colostrum. Because when we take a look at how well that gets absorbed through the intestinal wall, um, you know, over time that gut closure is going to happen within 24 hours. And so as we look at that, you know, those immunoglobulins coming up and being absorbed through the bloodstream, over time that intestinal wall closes, and eventually those globulins can't get absorbed through the bloodstream. And so again, kind of going back to that timing of how soon we wanna get that colostrum in, the sooner the better, because um, we notice that the absorption level drops significantly uh, within those first couple hours. So we wanna be, be able to maximize uh, that high quality colostrum early on. So we talked about measuring colostrum quality but it's also important to think about what we do after we collect that colostrum, because that's also important to quality. We can have a really good high quality product, uh, but if we collect it and there's um, you know, hiccups or issues along the way of processing that milk, and all of a sudden we have some bacterial issues, um, that can actually cause more harm than good. So we have to think about all the processes that happen between collecting that milk to the time it gets to the kid, uh, whether that's storing, freezing, cooling, heat treating, how, cl how clean our, our equipment is, and, and thawing that milk. So we have to start with, you know, collecting that milk with clean equipment. Um, and we want to be able to make sure, again, that we're feeding that milk within one to two hours. Um, if we can't feed that milk within one to two hours after we've collected it, then we need to think about refrigerating it as soon as we can. Um, and then again, if we're not using that colostrum up right away in the refrigerator, uh, it really should be fed or at least frozen uh, within 24 hours to really limit the bacterial growth. Um, Iowa State University actually did some uh, bacterial colostrum studies a few years ago looking at, um, you know, both of these and looking at uh, the industry overall, about 40% of herds um, could get a high quality colostrum and have a clean product. So there's a lot of wiggle room of, of increased bacterial growth. And what they found is, you know, less than 24 hours in the refrigerator and getting it frozen if we're not going to be able to use it um, as soon as possible. So being able to freeze that and then thinking about thawing as another process, um, being able to freeze it in small quantities, whether that's ice cube trays, Ziploc bags, uh, small ounce bottles um, that we can store in the refrigerator or freezer, and then allow them to either thaw at room temperature or a, a, a warm water bath um, at less than 120 degrees so we can avoid denaturing those proteins. Anytime we get above that temperature level, uh, we run the risk of um, denaturing those IgG levels in that colostrum. Heat treat colostrum is another um, thing that we talk to our producers about uh, because we know that disease transfer can happen from colostrum to um, kids. And so we wanna limit that, that transfer. And if we heat treat colostrum, particularly for um, reducing the risk of CAE, um, we wanna be able to heat treat. And one thing just to remember that, you know, heat treating is not the same as pasteurization. Heat treating is uh, using a lower temperature versus a pasteurization uh, temperature, which we use about 165 degrees. Low, uh, uh, heat treated temperature is gonna be about 135 to 140 degrees uh, for this dairy goat colostrum. So again, using a hot water bath in the range of about 135 to um, 139 and be able to hold that temperature for an hour. Um, again, anything that we get above that 140 degree mark, we're gonna start to destroy those antibodies and we'll get more of a pudding like consistency with the products and it's not gonna be very palatable um, to those animals being fed. So there are commercial devices available or homemade options that we could use, um, but
but the important thing is being able to monitor that temperature and being able to hold that for the, the duration of the 60 minutes. So then the other questions come about, you know, Claustrum quality, whether I have the quality of claustrum that I need, and if I don't, then what are my options? Uh, thinking about feeding these kids. Um, obviously, the best option is if we have a high quality product coming from that freshening dough um, that's heat treated. If we don't have that option, maybe we've had some doughs in the past that have produced high quality and we've frozen that um, and, and heat treated that colostrum. Um, so that would be an option. We do have colostrum replacers um, that contain antibodies. However, they're not gonna be farm specific. And um, from, um, from industry, uh, we don't have any that are uh, dairy, goat, or sheep specific. They're more bovine origin re or related. So uh, they're not gonna be um, maybe as accurate in the antibody levels as uh, dairy goat colostrum. We could use heat treated cow colostrum. Um, as an option, uh, but would not recommend using milk replacer as they don't, it does not contain any antibodies, has a lower nutrient content, um, and we want to wait till we uh, have about, you know, after 24 hours to, to feed, start feeding that milk replacer. So that leads me to my uh, second poll question here, talking about um, what type of colostrum people are using. So I'm going to um, Go back and launch that. So your main source of colostrum, let's see. And it's not letting me, oops. All right, so now you should be able to see that. So your main source of colostrum, um, what is it, your main source being fed to your kids? Is it colostrum collected from a fresh dough? Is it heat treated colostrum, whether that's fresh or frozen? A colostrum replacer, the heat treated colostrum. Um, so, and the milk replacer, um, which we gen we would not recommend feeding, but um, I put that, that as um, an option there. So we'll give you a few seconds to, to fill that in. Jen, just real quickly, there's some task bars up on top of the screen that are covering your slides. And I'm just wondering yeah. if you might have another program open that might be causing that. I just closed the, there was like an enable. Um, okay, so one one went off, there's yeah. still one more okay. up there, which is fine. Yep, yeah. yeah. and I think that's my task bar for like chat and stuff. Um, okay. Let's see if I can. I don't think I it, move it to the bottom, maybe. Yep. Thanks for letting me know. Not a problem. Is it gone now? Um, it's still there, but okay, it's gone. Yep, you got it. Okay. Sounds good. Thank Thanks. You. All right. Well, that gave people time to fill in the poll question there. So I'm going to end that and share your results. So it looks like the majority are feeding colostrum collected from that fresh dough. Uh, followed by heat treated colostrum or a colostrum replacer. Okay. Just give me a second. Now that I moved that task bar, it went on my slide set. So, okay. So, um, as we talk about the options for feeding different types of colostrum, uh, looking at just colostrum substitutes, um, it's really important to look at the nutrient analysis of, of these um, supplements or replacers to know that we're getting adequate colostrum into these. Um, and Dr. Robert Von, Van Zahn, if I, uh, if I mix up this, please interject here. But um, when we're looking at this nutrient label, it's saying we have 65 grams of globulin protein. So if you take that 65 grams of IgGs into 16 ounces or that pound, you're getting about four grams per ounce of IgG. And then we're needing to feed that at two ounces per four pounds of body weight. And if our typical dairy goat kid weighs about eight pounds, that means this uh, dairy goat kid is receiving about 16 grams of IgGs from this colostrum replacer. 
So I just make a note there, you know, kind of going back to those previous slides of trying to get at least 35 grams of IgGs into those dairy goat kids. Um, you know, you might have to feed using a second feeding of this uh, to reach those levels uh, when we're talking about replacers or supplements. Again, some limited studies looking at colostrum being fed versus replacer. Um, and this, this research looks at how feeding natural colostrum and colostrum replacer are different and fed at different feeding rates. So those colored lines uh, reflect feeding higher feeding levels. Uh, the red is actually being that colostrum being fed at a higher rate and the blue is, is a colostrum replacer being fed at a high rate. And then the blue line that's going um, across at 1500, that represents the serum IgG protein levels of these dairy goat kids that we wanna be able to reach. And you, so you can see that um, at a minimum that, that high rate of colostrum, natural colostrum being fed is the only one that's being able to reach those uh, concentration levels um, within, within those kids. So just kind of wrapping up here, I know I went through this fairly quickly, but talking about you know, a successful colostrum program, uh, we want to make sure that it's high quality. So uh, being able to test that colostrum, uh, collecting it as soon as we can, uh, but also means squeaky clean and heat treating. Um, the Penn State data shows at least a minimum of 35 grams of IgGs. Uh, we didn't talk too much about quantity, but um, you know, 10 to 15% at a minimum of their birth weight. So one ounce per pound of body weight. Uh, we may have to divide this into two feedings if we have some smaller animals. Um, again, quickly, as soon as possible. Uh, so within that first couple hours. Um, and another topic uh, that Penn State was looking at was, um, you know, method of feeding. You know, if we're nursing for bottle feeding, tubing, uh, or feeding through a nipple pail, um, I didn't show this slide, Dr. Robert, but you know the, the data shows no difference in IgG concentration between these these feeding methods, uh, at least with this research. But again, I feel um, you know we have some limited research, and I think there's ongoing projects looking at colostrum quality and the type of colostrum quali quality going into these kids. Um, but as we transition here, you know, just thinking about this really is the single most important management factor for the for the health and survival of these kids here. So with that, Dr. Robert Van Zahn, I'm going to um, stop sharing my screen here and we're going to let you share your screen. And we're going to continue our presentations talking about feeding the neonatal. So once we get them through that classroom phase, uh, what are our next steps? So thanks for joining us. All right. Thank you very much, Jennifer, and uh, look forward to, uh, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions about uh, some of the data and everything. Uh, just, just to reinforce what Jennifer was uh, going through, our biggest problem right now in the sheep and goat industry is we really have no handle at all on colostrum. And yet it's the single most important thing for our newborn animals. So this is an area that really needs uh, a lot of work. So I want to go ahead and get started first uh, to kind of give you an overview here. Um, I, I look at the nutrition of the newborn and young animal in four phases. First phase is actually starting with the feeding of the doe and how we feed that doe from the moment she has been bred has an impact on that offspring. And there's lots of really fantastic data that's out there now on how it can affect feed, how we feed mom affects ultimately the metabolic abilities of the offspring, the, the hair, the number of uh, o sites on their ovaries and females. It, it's just unbelievable. Where I'm interested is more in the mineral accretion because we know uh, that milk is not 
as perfect of a food as we sometimes give it credit for. Um, milk is very deficient in most of our trace elements. You know, think about veal calves on a milk diet being iron deficient. And we also know that selenium is low in milk and copper is low, zinc is marginal and, and so on. And so this is an issue uh, we need to feed mom properly uh, from a mineral standpoint so that she can pass these minerals on to her fetus. And that's an area uh, that we've been doing a fair amount of work in, an important one because all these trace elements are important relative to the immune response of the newborn. And then, of course, as Jennifer just talked about the formation of colostrum, uh, how we feed mom, even though our dairy work and our dairy cattle suggests minimal impacts of, of dietary changes on colostrum, that the early data that I'm seeing uh, would suggest there's really some pretty significant effects of protein and energy in the diet. So the second phase uh, is the colostrum and nursing phase. Jennifer talked about the colostrum feeding, so I'm not going to go back over that. But certainly how we fed mom in the dry period uh, is going to impact how well she's going to be able to milk the composition of milk. This is obviously going to have a great effect on the growth of the uh, newborn. And then we have to deal with if we're, if we're harvesting the milk for our economic uh, product, then we're going to be moving to milk replacer and we need to be able to identify what a quality milk replacer is in appropriate feeding practices. Another sort of critical phase in our newborn is transitioning from this milk consuming organism into you know, a, a more economically sound uh, forage consuming organism. And that's part of what we call the weeding phase. And what's critical to that phase is making sure that that fiber digesting or fiber fermenting vat of, uh, that's in the foregut here uh, is developed properly. And we do actually have a fair amount of good data relative to our sheep and goats. And it follows very well the data that we have on our, our dairy, dairy animals for that. And what this is going to impact is the capacity to digest fiber and the ability of the microbes to provide protein to the animal. Where I see problems is, you know, these younger animals get weaned and we start to see what's often called uh, hay belly. And essentially those are animals that they can't digest that fiber very well. And they're actually becoming protein uh, starved. And then the final phase that I'm not going to touch on much is the post weaning phase. And of course, that's going to be so much influenced by what our growth objectives are and, and what we need for rate of gain and the composition of gain. So I want to start off with, uh, you know, to me, as, as you heard in my introduction, um, from my practice experience, veterinary practice experience, uh, I, I am just so convinced that the pregnant animal is really the single most important animal on the farm uh, because she's going to have so much potential impact on, on the, the bottom line of the farm. And so I use this quote from... Um, Doc, or, uh, from John Wooden, the UCLA basketball coach, uh, failing to prepare is preparing to fail. And that's the last thing we want to do with our pregnant animals. And so some of the things that can come about because of failing to prepare could be things like uh, pregnancy toxemia, milk fever, or hypocalcemia. Uh, we, we just got done talking about the colostrum, we could have very poor colostrum supply or quality. And of course, you know, as you saw from the data that we have, even on an individual farm, it's all over the board, which is suggesting to me that we really don't have a good handle on the appropriate feeding practices here for our late pregnant animals. What I'm going to focus a little bit more on is the impact of what potentially poor milk yield has on the kid growth and and how this might impact uh, postnatal losses. So 
just to, to kind of put a final touch on uh, the key issues from feeding mom as it impacts our uh, newborns, we really need to focus on making sure we got enough energy in here. We don't want the, the does to get fat, but we also don't want them to uh, lose body condition. And we also need to remember that, and I, I hate to say this, but that those kids, those fetal kids inside a mom are basically parasites, really big parasites, and they suck glucose and amino acids from mom like crazy. So if we are not going to feed her appropriately, she's going to break down her body because she made the effort to get pregnant and she's going to try and stay pregnant at all costs. And so we need to remember that to generate glucose in our ruminant animals, we need to feed some cereal grains in that late gestation period. I'm focused a lot on the metabolizable protein, uh, being able to ensure we have adequate amino acids to support fetal development so that we don't get low birth weights, as Jennifer had talked about, as well as we now know if we feed additional metabolizable protein to the late pregnant animal, we can actually reduce fecal egg counts. We can, we can decrease the parasitic periparturient rise that we see during this transition from pregnancy into lactation. So that can help us in our parasite control. All of the energy and protein is dependent on the quality of your forage. The forage neutral detergent fiber, or NDF, is a major player in how much these does can eat. And you can imagine if they got twins and triplets or quads or even quints inside them, they can't eat a lot of, if, you know, a lot of what we call effective fiber. The chart over on the right here is uh, some data from sheep. And I believe this holds very well for, um, for goats, but it's just showing NDF intake as a percent of uh, body weight. And then you can see for uh, sheep that had singles, twins, or triplets, this is the NDF content of the forage. These are the weeks of gestation. So this is about a month out. And then this is in the last couple of weeks of gestation. And you'll notice for singles, we're kind of hovering up in that 0.8% range. Uh, but you notice that with poor quality forage, we're on the lower end. With twins, you can see we start to drop down to the 0.7 range and, and even slightly lower with triplets. So we really have to watch that forage quality and make sure we're uh, we allow the animal to eat what she needs to eat to ensure that she's getting enough energy and protein into her. So now let's talk a little bit about that mineral and vitamin side of things. Um, mom is capable of, of moving minerals from her blood. And what the fetus does is the fetus accumulates these minerals in its liver. And then once the fetus is born, it can mobilize those mineral resources that it has in its liver to help support uh, its body functions, its immune function, and so on, growth rate, um, when it's on a milk-based diet that's deficient in that. Now, if we look at this, uh, placental transfer does not occur for vitamins A, D, and E. And these are all very important uh, vitamins. And so big question is, how do they get it? Well, they get it from the colostrum. Colostrum is very, very concentrated. If you remember that chart that Jennifer showed earlier, that colostrum is very concentrated in the fat-soluble vitamins. But that's assuming you're giving mom fat-soluble vitamin supplements because if she's on uh, dried forage that you harvested during the summer, uh, during the traditional uh, gestation period of winter time, getting ready for this time of year for kidding season, she's actually on a vitamin deficient diet unless you're supplementing. Uh, placental transfer is really critical to um, uh, mineral transfer. And as far as my data shows, we can't intoxicate the fetus. The fetus has a, a, a barrier that prevents from becoming intoxicated. 
Then colostrum ingestion, as you saw again from that chart, this is really the single most important slug of the fat soluble vitamins that uh, the, the, the newborn kids will get. Plus, there's some additional trace minerals in there, but not anything close to what happens over the placenta. But both the placental transfer and the colostral transfer is dependent on how well we feed mom. So just re-emphasizing that this late pregnant diet, the dry dough diet is really critical. Now, just to show some examples, uh, I've had a number of cases, uh, especially in some boar goats, but also I've seen this in sheep and, and others. Uh, this was one example where the, the uh, doe herd was showing poor fertility. They had a number of deaths in the does and they had a, a, a really big problem with abortion and stillborns. We uh, did necropsies on a number of the uh, stillborn or aborted kids. We weren't able to identify an infectious cause but all of the kids had low liver copper. And uh, it turns out that on this farm, they had high molybdenum in their forages. And, and again, this is getting beyond where I'm gonna be with the topic today, but high molybdenum um, can in the rumen form a compound that binds to copper and makes copper unavailable. And so with some of the work I've done on in dairy and beef side of things, uh, in the cattle side, trace mineral deficiencies like iodine deficiency, which is a big one for our boar goats. They have a high iodine requirement, copper, selenium, and zinc. These can all contribute to abortion or stillbirth issues depending on the severity uh, of mom's diet. All right, so let's move into the next, the, the nursing phase, uh, the second phase here. Uh, Jennifer's already covered the colostrum side. So now we start thinking about how are we gonna feed milk, uh, grain to uh, start that rumen development as we'll get into. And of course, we always need to have water. Milk by itself is not sufficient um, fluids to, to support the newborn. The newborn is, is a fairly high water body uh, composition. And so milk by itself is not going to be adequate. Water is going to help facilitate dry feed intake. So the grain that I'm going to argue is important for rumen development, as we'll see, is really uh, going to be based on how much water we have for, for those kids. So there's a number of decisions that you as the uh, owners and, and managers of your goats need to decide, you know, are you going to be dough raising them or bottle raising them, you know, so that that's, you know, milk, uh, dairy goats versus uh, meat goats, how many offspring per dam, uh, you know, what are you going to do if you have some of these that are, they're popping out four and five uh, kids, the number of times uh, fed per day and the volume, uh, are you going to use a kid bar, a bottle or a bucket feeding system? You know, uh, are you going to use some kind of uh, whole milk, maybe cow's milk or, or uh, other or a milk replacer? What temperature are you going to be feeding at? What's your anticipated weaning age that you want to shoot for? And then um, how are you going to try and manage some of the, the common disease issues like enterotoxemia? That's the overeating disease, uh, your parasites, coccidia, and so on. So let's look at what's important in, uh, in uh, kid milk replacers. Now, lamb and kid milk replacers are very similar. Um, compared to dairy, uh, dairy cattle, uh, our small ruminants have a higher protein and a higher fat content. All right. So uh, typically what we're looking for in milk replacers, and I'll show you some tags uh, we should be looking at something in that 25 to 30 percent fat. Uh, 23 would be the lowest I'd go, uh, preferably closer to 28 percent protein, and then 30 to 35 percent uh, lactose. Now you can figure the lactose percent uh, from the label with that formula that I give you. Um, uh, most of these milk replacers are going to be about 90. The powders are going to be about 98, 97% uh, dry matter. 
So you could just basically say a hundred minus whatever the crude protein, the fiber, the uh, fat and the ash and, and come up with a, a rough estimate of the lactose. Um, protein sources should be exclusively from milk-based proteins, not from uh, processed soy or wheat bran or wheat flour or anything like that. And one way you can look at it, it's not a perfect way, but it's, it's a pretty good way is if the crude fiber is less than 0.15%, you know that you probably uh, don't have any kind of plant protein sources. And in ash content, this is your mineral, uh, runs generally in that six to, to 8% uh, range. Now, when we mix that powder up into water, we have to be careful because there are uh, the compounds that are in the powder as they get diluted, they can cause diarrhea themselves if they're too concentrated. And so when we look at the total solids in milk, cow's milk runs about 12 to 13 percent total solids, whereas uh, sheep and goat milk run slightly higher. So typically our recommendation is somewhere is in that 14 percent up to 18. 18 is pushing it. I would do that maybe in the uh, colder weather. Uh, sheep run slightly higher than that, but I definitely would never go above a 20 percent just due to the, the high risk of indigestion or potential bloat and, and enterotoxemia. If we dilute it too much, if we get too conservative and cautious, then we're going to have inadequate intake and our, our animals are going to do very poorly. Now, uh, Jennifer showed you a picture of that BRICS, the digital BRICS refractometer. That refract refractometer uh, can also measure total solids in milk uh, replacers as well, uh, or mixed milk, milk replacers, as well as the uh, total protein in serum. So these are really good tools that you could have to evaluate different aspects of your uh, early kid uh, feeding management. So uh, in terms of kid milk replacers, Typical mixing uh, directions that you should see. You want to read these on the label. Uh, for goats, it's usually about 2.7 to 3 ounces of milk replacer powder per pint of water. And that gets you up to about 14 to 16% solids. Lambs are slightly higher to get us up to a, a slightly higher solids. Um, we can, um, you know, also, uh, try, you know, you can mix at a, a larger volume. How you want to mix these, again, if you read the label, you got to really use warm water to, to get it into solution, and then you can cool it down for, for the feeding. You may want to use slightly warmer milk to get them started, if, uh, to, to get them adapted to the milk replacer, and then use cold milk to... Uh, kind of minimize the, the overeating. So I'm just giving you some examples up here on uh, the ounces of milk replacer, the pints of water, and then this is ounces per pint, and then the calculated total solids using this equation here. And this is just some examples I took off of some milk replacer uh, labels to show that they are in that, that 14 to 16% range here. So let's look at a couple different replacers. Uh, here's one called Dose Match. This is a specific kid replacer. Uh, if we look down here, you can see the crude protein is 25. The fat is 28, so that's good. Uh, crude fiber, no more than 0.15. So that means it's probably all um, milk-based proteins. And then we have vitamins A, D, and E. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't have or wasn't able to find the full analysis here because I would want to look at things like selenium and copper and, and so on. Uh, here's the mixing directions uh, going into the schedule. This is the schedule right here. I, this is in pounds, so I put it in ounces so that it's, uh, you know, we're comparing apples to apples here. And then you can see here the kid weights, 
Uh, and then you would be looking at, you know, for a six pound kid, about 3.2 ounces. And this would be the, the pints of the mixed that would be fed per day for this, okay? And you'll notice here that it says always free choice water and high quality dry feed. Looking at another um, milk replacer, if we take a look at the analysis, you can see the crude protein here is 26%, so slightly lower than the one previous. Fat is low at 20%. Um, fiber is that appropriate level. And then this one shows you a few more. You can see the copper is somewhere between 10 and 15 parts per million. Uh, the selenium at 0.3, which is, you know, so if this is going to be the sole feed, that would be appropriate. And then, of course, we have uh, some of the vitamins here. We look at our uh, ingredients. We see dried whey protein concentrate, dried whey, dried whey product. So these are all our protein sources. So, so that's good. And then they have, you know, the mixing uh, type thing. So I'm a little concerned on the energy value with this crude uh, fat at only 20%. And I'll show you some data later on about that. One more here. Um, here's our guaranteed analysis. The protein here is 24. So it's on the lower end. Fat's 25, our fiber's good at 0.17. And then you can see here now the copper ranges from six to 15. That, that's, that's bothersome to me. They could, they could certainly be uh, in a tighter realm there. Um, if we look at our ingredient list, dried skim milk, dried whey protein concentrate, dried whey product, dried milk protein. So those are all good sources. Uh, just that the total amount is sort of on what I would consider the lower end. So our first product seemed to have the better balance of nutrients. Our second product was low in fat. This product is, is lower in protein, but not uh, horrific. And then they have their feeding uh, practices here. Now, one more here. Uh, this, is, this is my pet peeve with the feed industry no matter how much we instruct that sheep are not goats and goats are not sheep, there's so many products on the market that are targeted both species. And so if we take a look at this product, crude protein's 24, the fat's 30. So a little low on the protein, but good on the fat, the fiber's appropriate, the ashes is there uh, and uh, the selenium and so on. But you'll notice that compared to the previous uh, two, there's nothing on copper here. Um, we take a look then at our ingredients. So dried skim milk, dried whey, you know, all our good milk proteins, vegetable fat. And as we read on down through, there's no copper source. So this might be appropriate for a lamb. However, this is not going to be appropriate for a kid, especially if your uh, dry dough diet wasn't providing uh, an appropriate mineral balance uh, for the animals. All right, so milk replacer feeding amounts, uh, you know, a, a, a general uh, rule of thumb is 10 to 15 percent of body weight per day approximately three ounces per pound of body weight is another a good way of looking at it. You really want to start out feeding multiple times per day and allow them to adjust. Uh, and then you can reduce it down to two or three feedings per day or using milk bars. In a self-feeding system, they generally will consume about two to four pints uh, per day of milk replacer. This is equivalent to about a half a pound to three quarters of a pound of milk replacer powder. Um, and again, in a self-feeding system, you want to use chilled milk so that they don't over, over consume. Now, here's that chart that I wanted to uh, highlight the difference. So what we're looking at here is a milk replacer. This is the energy density. Uh, you know, the numbers don't mean a whole heck of a lot. Uh, but obviously, this number is higher than this number. And the reason is this is a 30% crude fat 
product, and this is a 20% crude fat product. Same proteins. I use 20, 26% protein here. Now, what I'm looking at, this is the uh, amount of milk replacer powder that they would be eating. And we said it'd be between a half a pound to three quarters of a pound. So a pound is 450 uh, grams. So here we would be looking at a half a pound would be about 125 grams or so. Here is the, the kid with body weights. And the yellow part of this is the maintenance energy requirement and then the growth requirement. This is assuming that they're growing at about 100 to 150 grams per day. Now, this would be typical of a dairy uh, kid. Uh, if this is a boar goat, they're going to be upwards of 200 to 400 grams per day. So this is based on the, the most recent National Research Council uh, publication on sheep and goat requirements. So let me put in, here is uh, four ounces or a quarter of a pound, all right? And you can see that um, we meet the energy requirements of a six pound kid and just miss it for a nine pound kid. But on this product where we're only feeding 20% uh, crude fat, we don't even meet here. So that means we wouldn't be able to achieve this rate of gain. If we move up to a higher, uh, 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 just under a half a pound, you know, uh, we're looking at, you know, 6.4 ounces of, of milk replacer. You can see other than the bigger kid here, we're meeting the energy and uh, needs for both maintenance and growth. Whereas here, yeah, we can meet it for the six and nine pound kids, but not for our 12 and 15. So we're going to see compromised rate of gain. And this might lead depending on how severe this gets, to um, uh, immune dysfunction, and they may be more prone to diarrhea, coccidia, respiratory disease, and, and other problems. All right, so does it really matter how many times a day? Well, the little data that's out there and, and some of the uh, people I've worked with that are uh, you know, been been in the goat uh, industry quite a bit. They they feel three x feeding is far superior to two x feeding, and that's even at the same volume per day. Uh, minimal difference between free choice and three x feeding. If uh, hay, uh, grain, and hay, I'm not, I'm not sure the hay is necessary, but certainly grain and water available. Free choice adjustments are made for cold, and then volume intakes are are being managed. So what do we do when it's cold? Well, we could increase the solids slightly to offset the cold stress, but that's not the sole thing we wanna do. Uh, we don't wanna go much above this 18% because then we can potentially cause uh, bloat and indigestion leading to enterotoxemia. So what we gotta do beyond 18% is add volume, all right? So we can add up to about 25% more volume per day. Uh, and then we wanna uh, you know, kind of you know, monitor how well they're doing so that make sure they're not losing uh, any kind of significant body weight. Certainly, we want to keep them warm, have lots of good deep bedding, uh, use heat lamps or heaters if necessary for uh, accessory type uh, heating. All right, this gets us into the uh, next sort of critical phase in uh, raising our goats is the weaning management. And weaning obviously is uh, beyond uh, the birthing process is the most stressful time for the kid. Uh, the weaning, uh, you know, we need to wean our kids based on our program intentions. Uh, again, depending on if they're going into a market system or they're being raised for replacements or, or whatever. And um, it should be based on solid feed consumption and not just the age of the animal, all right? So uh, kids, goat kids should increase their body weight by two, two and a half times their birth weight uh, by the time they're weaned uh, in a typical weaning system. Age of weaning can range from anywhere from four to eight weeks. 
Uh, and then once they've been weaned, they need to be on high quality forage. They cannot be on that rougher stuff that the does are, are able to consume. So this creep feeding or, or starter feed would be uh, an appropriate practice here. Uh, typically creep feed, uh, it's very palatable ingredients. Uh, corn, corn should be either whole or cracked. Um, soybean meals, molasses, maybe alfalfa pellets or beet pulp, and then a coccidia control agent if that's uh, something you need to be uh, addressing. Ideally, starting about three days of age or earlier, water needs to be provided, as I said, to stimulate this intake. And as I'm going to show you in a moment, it's this stuff here, not hay, but this stuff here that actually initiates the development of the rumen and allows them to become a, a true ruminant and eat forage. Um, creep feed can also offset poor maternal milk yield and minimize some of the body condition loss and, and overall improve uh, uh, gain. So if we take a look at a newborn kid, this is kind of what the dynamics of the rumen uh, abomasum omasum system is the, the four chambers of the, the fermentation, digestive stomach digestion. The abomasum is much larger. And this is there because the, the milk consumption. All right. So then we, we offer the uh, creep feed, the rumen bacteria, which the animal is going to pick up, interacting with mom, interacting with others, interacting with the environment. Uh, we can't prevent bacteria from getting into the rumen. The rumen bacteria are going to start to ferment this feed. What they produce are the typical end products called volatile fatty acids. Acetate is one, and this is mainly coming from fiber. So like if you have alfalfa hay and, and beet pulp in there, Propionate is coming from the starch sources, uh, the corn or oats or something, and then butyrate can come from either one of those sources. So those compounds are going to be generated in that rumen. Well, it turns out that butyrate, and this has been shown and documented well in research in cattle, but also in sheep and in goats, it's butyrate that the cells that line the rumen that will uh, prefer to metabolize and allow for the growth of the papillae, the little finger projections inside the rumen. So if I go back one, let me see here. See, this is what the rumen looks like here. Now, as we start to feed the grain and butyrate starts to develop, you'll see the rumen starts to get larger and we get the growth of papillae, the metabolic activity. And then after weaning, that's what the adult animal's rumen system is going to look like. The abomasum is a very minor structure compared to the rest of the rumen. So uh, there has been work in goats that has documented that uh, this butyrate is responsible from taking uh, this kind of look on the rumen wall to this kind of look. These aren't worms or anything. These are all the papillae that absorb all the fermentation end products uh, of, of this, of uh, what is in the rumen there. And so there's even some creep feeds out on the market now that are adding sodium butyrate to uh, their products so that it can help improve the development more uh, quickly of the rumen, making an easier trans transition. All right, so here's a study in goats where they uh, did two different feeding practices for weaning, a traditional milk feeding, and then they would uh, provide them the post weaning diet. All right, so no starter feed at all. And then, so that's called the TR, the traditional uh, uh, method. And then the other was a starter feed being provided uh, at about 30 days on up to the uh, post weaning diet. All right. And that's called the AR, alternative uh, rearing process. So here you can see the TR and AR. And then these are days post uh, birth. So the first two weeks and then the second two weeks on up. 
And so if we just take a look here, body weights, there was really no huge difference in body weights uh, across the whole study. Milk intakes really weren't that different. But here we see that the AR, the alternative rearing, they started to eat the uh, kid starter and then ate more. And you can see here at 30 days is when they started to provide the alternative solid feeds. The traditional animals ate some of that, but notice how much more they ate here. And then if you compare those all the way up, that it, it's not until we're out here at 75 to 90 days that the traditional goats, the traditional fed uh, weaning uh, kids catch up in terms of uh, intake. If we look at total intake here, again, we can see uh, big differences in this 60 to 60, 75 days and 45 to 60 days. And then if we look at average daily gains, we have the one negative side here uh, when we first start offering the, the starter feed as well as the grower feed. I would prefer not to be adding this quite yet because of this. But once you get beyond that, the average daily gain is superior all the way through up here. And the efficiency with which those animals uh, those goats uh, utilize their food is much better. So the, the alternative reared managed goats had better room and function and development compared to the traditional rearing type system. So some take home messages. If we're going to feed our goats and expect them to become uh, critical parts of our herd or be profitable for, for our enterprises, we need to consider these four critical phases in, in the nutrition of, of the young goat. Any problem in one of these four, it's hard to make up for that um, problem by changing any of the other three. Colostrum management, as was uh, first part of our program here, critical step room and development is the next most critical step. And that is just essential to a successful uh, transition and minimizing health issues. Dietary energy and protein are the primary determinants of quality neonatal growth. And then feeding programs, your feeding program, uh, there's no one template that fits all farms. They got to be designed around your outcomes, your desired outcomes for what you're doing with your kids, the available resources that you have and the facilities that you have. So with that, I think Jennifer and I can answer some questions. I saw a few in the chat box and appreciate uh, you taking the time this afternoon to listen to us and uh, we'll go from there. All right. Thank you, Dr. Van Zahn. That was uh, very good. And we'll, um, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat box there. Or if you want to unmute, you can certainly do that as well if you want to ask your question. Um, as those are coming in, I would just remind you that I did put the Qualtrics evaluation for this webinar in the chat box. So before you uh, leave here today, if you wouldn't mind clicking on that and just taking that short evaluation, that'll help us with our, our programming here. Um, again, it is going to be recorded. I think somebody did ask about that. So we'll get that um, out in a couple days here. Um, so I'm just looking here in the chat to see if there's other questions. Um, I did have one question um, about weaning. And um, you talked about that kind of the step down one to two weeks prior to weaning. Do you see? Uh, producers just doing like one step down or is there a couple phases within that two weeks? Is it just, or is it just two weeks prior they're cutting milk levels in half or is it kind of a more step down? Yeah, so, so what we would be looking at there, it, the, the way the study that is presented in that table, it looks like there was like two phases that they did this but that's just collective data over that time period, those 15 days. So they didn't really, you know, what we saw was um, 
the animals just started when they were offered the, the uh, starter feed, they just started eating more in the first week that it was offered it in, in the second week, and then they offered the other feed. And so it was much more of the, the kids themselves switching over from milk feeding to, to that, but they, they did, um, you would have to sort of reduce the availability of milk somewhat to, to get that initiated. Mm -hmm. Jen, just so you know, there's a question in the chat box about the link for the evaluation not working. Okay. Oh, looks like she got it to work. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Any other questions, Fred or Larry, that you saw come in? Uh, Dr. Van Zan, I'd like to go back to our transition and, and high producing does when you were talking about the forage. Uh, what would be your recommendation or comments on uh, feeding a, a quality toxin free fermented forage? On a, a fermented forage, so like a, a uh, uh... corn silage or haylage. Yeah. So when I, when I was in Michigan, we fed corn silage quite a bit. I have a, a few goat farms uh, feeding corn silage here. Um, I know uh, alfalfa or grass silage is fed to goats um, quite a bit. Uh, a lot of goat people shy away from the silages because they're so worried about listeria but um, if the silage is done well, uh, that's a minimal problem. So um, I'm, I'm a big fan of it because uh, it, especially for our larger uh, operations, uh, being able to, to mix a total mixed ration rather than just feeding uh, a heavy amount of grain in the milking parlor and, and end up having lots of problems with uh, ruminal acidosis, I, I rather uh, see the, the total mixed ration approach. That was kind of my next question. Do you find any drawbacks when you're using a TMR for the, and traditionally the transition dose or the high producing pan? Uh, that's a great question, Fred. Um, I, working with, uh, uh, a couple different dairies, we yet don't know the, the optimum particle length that we should have in our TMRs for our goats. We know goats are much better sorters than um, cattle are. And of course, here at Penn State, we developed the Penn State particle separation tool, and we use that for evaluating um, our dairy cattle rations um, in a in a dairy. Uh, I was working with a nine nine hundred doe dairy in Northern California, and uh, they were feeding a total mix ration. And on, they had a uh, they we added water to the ration uh, because they were using mostly dry hay, and we had to chop that. And so I did do some of the Penn State particle separation, and and not. Surprisingly, the does sorted against the long stuff. So we need to get enough stuff off of that top screen. Um, but they also sorted against the really fine stuff that cows lick up. So I was really kind of surprised at that. And, and so um, at least from what I saw, if we can maximize the material on that second and third screen is the, the best kind of distribution that I found with goats to try and ensure that they, they actually eat what we think they're, they're eating out of that TMR. The only downside on a TMR that I found in my experience so far is I think we were too conservative in adding grain to a TMR uh, in our late pregnant does. And we ended up popping a few more preg tox than I would like to see. And so we added a little more grain, just top dressed on that. And I think, you know, even though I, I did my calculations, um, I, this herd was running an awful lot of twins and triplets. And I think, uh, we probably were, um, 
too much too heavy on the on the NDF side in that TMR. Now, moving to another topic, you know, copper is really important in our. our let me shows. let me Fred give me one okay. second. I I noticed uh, somebody asked the chart that I showed about NDF and hay. That is not NDF 30, that's total NDF. NDF 30 is, is talking about NDF digestibility. That's a totally different issue. Uh, so what I was looking at is total NDF intake based on Dave Merton's work. All right, so copper, Fred. Well, no, we got a, another question oh. from uh, Sarah there uh, about the starch levels, maximum starch levels for creep feed. Uh, What's your thoughts on her question there? Yeah, that's a good one too. Um, we're really starting to uh, drop our starch levels in our in our um, calf creep feeds because in some of the studies that uh, my colleague Jed Heinrichs here at Penn State had done, we were getting ruminal acidosis like crazy on these uh, typical creep feeds that were running about 35% starch or so. So I'm, I'm recommending generally in that 15 to 21% starch range at, at max uh, for these creep feeds. And I would prefer to see uh, more of the, uh, a little beet pulp or something like that, because beet pulp is actually gets fermented to butyrate prefer, uh, preferentially and doesn't contribute to the starch load. So uh, adding a little extra beet pulp pellets or something like that into into a, a starter feed and backing off on the corn might be a good way to go. Okay, to move to the the copper question, we're in an area where I can see six ethanol plants from my front door. What about putting in distillers? Uh, dried distillers into our TMR for uh, milking goats. I think that's a good thing. Uh, I we worked on uh, you know that that dried distillers, the um, the it's forty four or so NDF. It's a nice fermentable NDF. There's a there's a, enough energy in there and the protein. Uh, the only downside I see on the distillers is and I think a lot of the, the, the ethanol plants have corrected for this is you don't want that high fat uh, because goats will, will act just like dairy cows. You feed them high linoleic acid from a distillers and you're going to see milk fat depression like crazy. Um, the only other thing too is the sulfur side of things because that sulfur is going to add to uh, potentially um, uh, compromise and copper status because that sulfur can easily be converted to uh, a sulfide form and then that sulfide binds with copper and and then that's going to make copper unavailable. So there's some limits on it, especially in our transition and high producing groups. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't think, you know, I know um, working with uh, Garland Dalkey there at Iowa State, um, I know the beef guys, you know, you know, that's, that's their, their bread and butter is feeding these distillers grains, but for a high producing uh, dairy dough or something like that, I, I would not allow as much distillers as the beef guys eat. <laughs> yeah. Larry, Jan, are you seeing other questions? Not seeing any other questions unless Larry you have any final questions. We are coming up past 115 here so yeah i don't have anything in addition good job okay lots of good questions and uh thanks for the conversation dr van zahn and appreciate you being on the webinar here today uh just a reminder we will be back on our webinar on march 23rd uh fred hall and dr gail carpenter are both going to be on about talking about feeding forages in her and their dairy goats so uh thanks everybody and we'll talk to you soon